Hi, and welcome to the show, where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Unji Chung. She is a biomedical engineer, and she wrote the Kevin MD article using nano couriers to deliver polycystic kidney disease drugs to just the right address. Unji, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Yeah, so currently I'm an assistant professor in biomedical engineering um, and also chemical engineering, surgery, and medicine at the University of Southern California, so in Los Angeles. I teach nanomedicine and drug delivery, but my lab develops nano biomaterial based strategies to deliver drugs for diagnostic applications and primarily focusing on diseases, um, including cardiovascular cancer and today's big passion of ours is for kidney diseases. Um, So just a little history about me personally, I was born in Seoul, Korea, and I came to the Midwest when I was about five. I grew up there, lived in California for a bit, and then I finished high school at an international school in Korea, actually, and then I came back to the States for college and, and grad school. And in college, I majored in molecular biology, and I was doing research regarding DNA and RNA synthesis, and you know, studying them in these unicellular model systems. And I think that experience was really exciting, but it, it really kind of showed me that I wanted to get closer to making a difference in potentially a patient, right, mm-hmm. and developing some technologies. And so I um, decided to go into biomedical engineering for my doctoral studies um, in Chicago. And there, I developed these um, biodegradable, biomimetic, regenerative implants. Uh, for orthopedic applications, including um, potentially synthetic ACL replacements. So really the, the idea there is, can we design materials so that they can inform tissue regeneration? And at the end, these materials will go away and degrade, but then newly formed tissue will be uh, replaced. And then from grad school, I wanted to go a little bit more on the molecular scale and on the nano scale. So for my postdoctoral fellowship, I uh, stayed in Chicago and I developed these nanoparticles that can traffic to biomarkers of plaques. Now this is in cardiovascular disease and Mm -hmm. atherosclerosis and trying to understand if we can kind of on a molecular level, figure out if plaques are likely to rupture. I think this concept of kind of, you know, targeting, going to the molecular site and really trying to understand and then designing around that is sort of how it's woven into my research continually today. The funny thing is, is, you know, science is amazing and so great in this way where you're studying something for cardiovascular disease. And I was trying to understand how they distribute in animal models. And I found that when we design the nanoparticles in a specific way, they actually go to the kidneys very efficiently. And I Mm -hmm. thought this was just an amazing insight and an an amazing thing that our nanoparticles do just because nanoparticles don't typically go to the kidneys. And And that's when sort of the idea struck, why don't we design these particles so they can deliver drugs for a specific kidney disease. And I started to get educated about polycystic kidney disease when I became a professor at USC. And I started collaborating with Dr. Ken Hallows, who's the chief of nephrology at USC. What are the most common applications that nanoparticles are used today in medicine? Nanomedicine is not a totally new concept. Um, The classic example is doxorubicin in liposomal nanoparticles called doxyl. And so those have been FDA approved since the 90s. Um, And then of course, more recently, although it's for emergency use authorization um, only, uh, you know, our COVID vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. The Moderna and the BioNTech um, Pfizer vaccines are these lipid nanoparticles that have the mRNA cargo and they're injected, you know, into our bodies to develop an antibody response against um, SARS-CoV-2. It's been amazing to see the word nanoparticle or mRNA being just part of common daily conversation because it's been a crazy devastating year. But if there was a small silver lining, it's that there's been this new light and there's been shedding of light into what nanomedicine technologies and can do and their potential. 
All right. So I'm interested in hearing your applications of this. And you wrote this in the Kevin MD article using nano couriers to develop polycystic kidney disease drugs to just the right address. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? So I wanted to first explain polycystic kidney disease because that's not necessarily something that everyone knows. And although autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease or ADPKD is the most commonly inherited prevalent kidney disease, as well as just one of the more common genetic diseases worldwide. They, there's just not much known about them for the everyday person. So this is a disease where you have a mutation and in some sets of your, some subset of your kidney, the cells will over proliferate and then they'll form these fluid filled cysts to the point where your um, kidneys enlarged almost to a football size. And usually it's, it's the size of your fist. So you can see how enlarged they are. And then it'll lead to um, kidney decline, um, function decline, and then the need for dialysis and transplantation. And so when I saw that observation, as I was mentioning earlier, I knew that kidney disease is something where we were going to go. And when I came to USC, I you know profusely sort of was you know, very enthusiastically emailing the nephrology department, Dr. Ken Hallows was very receptive. And, and this is where the scientists and the clinicians really work so well is that he's informing me about what's the latest in PKD. At the time, there was zero FDA approved drug. This is in 2016. In 2018, there became one FDA approved drug um, and just things in the pipeline. So this field is constantly changing. And as I was kind of scouring through the literature, there was no nanomedicine efforts for PKD. There's hardly very few efforts for kidney disease in general. And I thought that was just the strangest thing because nanomedicine for cancer has is not a new thing as I was mentioning earlier. And so especially with the COVID vaccines, I thought, you know what, this might be a good place where people are now familiar with nanoparticles and what that can do. And um, how the article started was that I got connected with Bill Brazel, who is one of the board members at the PKD Foundation. And he's also his professional life. It's in communication. So we got to talk and he just thought, wow, there's just so much potential. And he started to really advocate for this. And so I got connected with you. And so I wrote the article and I thought um, there could be really a lot more light that can be shed on PKD, as well as the potential for nanomedicine for PKD. The other thing that I wanted to mention today was, um, this is just a coincidence that the, the PKD Connect conference is happening currently in real time right now. And this is an amazing conference because this is, out of all the conferences that I know, this is the only one where the patients and the researchers are like in the same room together. Mm-hmm. So they're coming into my poster session. I'm learning about their challenges and it's very informative. And I think what I've heard from a lot of patients is that, the kind of like the regular nephrologist doesn't really know much about ADPKD either. And so they can give information about potentially tolvaptin, which is that one FDA approved drug, but not necessarily all the different advances. Again, this is a constantly changing field. So I think it would be amazing to have researchers, biomedical engineers, patients, clinicians, nephrologists, right, all get together and try to really move the needle. Give us a sense of how far down the pipeline uh, we are and how long will it take before we get any potential clinical trials of the approach you suggest? I'm hopeful. If, if I, I started to get in this field a little less than five years ago, at that time, I would have thought, I am not sure. Let's see where this goes. But now that we've come, you know, we know a little bit about what our technology can do for PKD. I feel like within the next five, 10 years is my personal goal. I think we can potentially find maybe a subset of PKD patients that this might be um, appropriate for. And, and so that is what I'm projecting. Although, you know, th- that's based on many things. So don't hold me to it. But that is ultimately what I think is possible. Mm-hmm. And work when working with uh, nanoparticles, and you mentioned that the uh, the FISO BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine being an example of that. What would you say are the biggest challenges using this technology? So I can't compare it with the COVID vaccine just because, you know, they're getting injected basically into our skin, into our muscles. Um, whereas other types of nanoparticles, um, they, for potential, you know, for cancer, they're IV injected because, you know, mm-hmm. for cancer patients, intravenous infusion or injection is, you know, the way that it's systemically delivered. The challenge for chronic patients, you know, chronic disease patients, 
is that this is, and especially for patients with hereditary disease, and, and I must say that this patient po- population is very well informed. Mm-hmm. They know what is going on. They are in the conference. They want to understand exactly what is happening. So they're a very informed patient population, which is amazing. You know, for us, though, they, they know potentially from an earlier age that they have a genetic disease that was passed on, you know, just, just from family history. There are def- definitely different challenges. For instance, uh, for us, nanomedicine has to be delivered in a manner where the, it doesn't affect their patients' lives, right? Mm-hmm. It, it has to be within the daily routine. You can't expect a patient to go you know, to the hospital, get an IV infusion every day or something. That, that doesn't really help their quality of life. Oral delivery, which is another part of the lab that is working on PKD, is that there are challenges to this too. When you take Tylenol or any other drug, it has to go through your stomach, into your intestines. It has to pass that barrier. Only a small percentage will go into your blood. It'll circulate. And then only a small subset of that will go to the right place. Then you won't feel a headache, et cetera. So for us, it's about being able to cross those oral delivery barriers. Mm-hmm. Don't get degraded in the stomach. Have a bigger depot in the, in the blood. And then, then our nanoparticles can do its thing, go to the kidneys and deliver that drug. So it's about designing the material to efficiently go through these different physiological processes. We're talking to Yunji Chung. She is a biomedical engineer, and she wrote to Kevin M. the article, using nanocouriers to develop polycystic kidney disease drugs to just the right address. Yunji, in the next few years, as a, as a practicing clinician myself, What could I expect to be the next breakthrough when it comes to nanoparticles in my daily clinical life? I think right now what I'm seeing from the research side, even from biotech companies, because they also have grant proposals, is that they're very focused on nanomedicine, especially Mm -hmm. in nanoparticle platforms, because they're understanding now, especially with the COVID vaccines, that um, there was a lot of underlying research that was done. And it might seem like the development was super fast in a very, you know, shortened timeline, but it wasn't. It was decades of research that informed the COVID vaccines to be developed correctly. And now it was able to be scaled and it was able to be taken off. And I think that's going to be applied in many different um, disease settings. So I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see these types of drugs encapsulated into nanoparticles because they can more efficiently get to the right place without getting diluted in other tissues that are going to cause side effects. I think that type of theme and technology, I think it's going to pop up more and more from this point on. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? So I, I would like to leave with the message that there is huge potential for nanomedicine and that, you know, for the PKD um, community, I just wanted to, I just advocate for nephrologists to continue to learn about ADPKD, the research behind ADPKD, the challenges that patients face, because um, this is a generational challenge as well. Um, and so th- for them to just get more involved in um, the advances, because it is in this particular field, it's just kind of changing year by year. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Great. Thank you for having me.